Hello there. Welcome back to Jenny Designs with Paper and this week's episode of Crime and Coloring, where we take an alphabetical journey through the United States and revisit some of the earliest crimes. Before we talk crime, let's talk coloring. I will be stamping this Bow Bunny Monster Stamp Set onto some Nina Solar White Classic Crest 80 pound cardstock and coloring with Prismacolor color pencils. I have scraps here because I don't know exactly how many or how big of a piece I'm going to need. And for smaller images, scraps are fantastic. I will be leaving the stamps in my Misty Stamp Positioner after I have stamped them the first time so that I can overstamp them when I have finished coloring. Anytime you color something with a wax base or even some watercolors, they do tend to dull down those stamped lines, making some of the details harder to see. So once I have finished coloring, I will go ahead and stamp these again. I will be stamping these monsters with VersaFine Claire Nocturne Black ink, and I've chosen to use colored pencils so I can get kind of that shaggy, hairy texture that I felt like these monsters deserved. Also, some of the parts of the monsters, their horns and their feet and their bellies, um, I will be using a blender pencil to kind of smooth out and um, remove that kind of hairy look. <laughs> some parts aren't hairy, I guess. I don't know. That's just kind of what I did today. So now that we have finished talking about, oh, one more thing. We're not finished talking about the coloring. When I color with colored pencils, I start by dropping in the shadows with my darkest pencil, and then I work toward my lightest pencil, which are the highlights, and then I go back over it from darkest to lightest again, two or even three times until I feel like the pigment is blended and there's very little of the white cardstock showing through. Now, now we're finished talking about the coloring and we can hop on into our crime. We have received the halfway mark on our alphabetical journey, stopping at state number 26 in Montana. Under the territorial governor, Thomas Meager, Montanans held a constitutional convention in 1866 in a failed bid for statehood. A second constitutional convention held in Helena in 1884 produced a constitution which was ratified three to one by Montana citizens. And that happened, the vote happened in November of 1844. However, for political reasons, Congress did not approve Montana statehood until February of 1889. President Grover Cleveland signed an ominous bill granting statehood to Montana North and South Dakota and Washington territories once the appropriate state constitutions were crafted. In July of 1889, Montanans convened their third constitutional convention and produced a constitution accepted by the people and the federal government. On November 8, 1889, President Benjamin Harrison proclaimed Montana the Union's 41st state. Interestingly enough, Montana has no official nickname, but several unofficial ones, most notably Big Sky Country, The Treasure State, Land of the Shining Mountains, and The Last Best Place. Also in Montana, the elk, deer, and antelope populations outnumber the humans. 46 out of Montana's 56 counties are considered frontier counties, with an average population of six, six or fewer people per square mile. Yellowstone National Park in southern Montana and northern Wyoming was the first national park in the nation. Montana has the largest gri grizzly bear population in the lower 48 states. Virginia City, Montana was founded in 1863 and is considered to be the most complete original town of its kind in the U.S. The largest observed snowflake fell during a storm in 1887 in Montana. Now, Montana has the record for the all-time temperature range recorded in um, 1937. The hottest temperature recorded in Montana was 170 degrees Fahrenheit at Medicine Lake. 
And then in 1954, Rogers Pass was a frigid negative 70 degrees Fahrenheit, making that temperature range 187 degrees. That is a bigger range than any other state in the Union. And most importantly, for our purposes here today, Montana is the final resting place to sheriff turned outlaw, maybe Harry Plummer. William Henry Handy Plummer with one M called Henry was born in Addison, Maine in 1832 to William Jeremiah and Elizabeth Handy Plummer and was the youngest of their seven children. His father, an older brother, and a brother-in-law were all sea captains, and Henry was expected to follow in their footsteps. However, the young man was slight of build and consumptive, meaning he was prone to tuberculosis, making the rigors of the sea trade too much for him to handle. When Henry was a teenager, his father died and the family began to struggle financially. Just two years after the California gold rush began, Henry promised his widow mother that he could help the family by making his fortune in the West. So, on April, or in April of 1852, 19-year-old Henry sailed from New York on a mail ship to Aspinwall, Panama, where he traveled by mule train to Panama City, then boarded another ship for the rest of his journey to California. 24 days after his departure, he arrived in San Francisco. Gaining a job at a bakery, Henry soon earned enough money to move on to the mining camps of Nevada County, California, which was about 150 miles north of San Francisco. Upon arriving at California, Henry changed the spelling of his surname to Plummer with two M's. I don't know if he just didn't know how to spell his name, or what, but he made it to ends. His mining venture went well, and after a year, he, a year after he arrived in California, rather, documents show that he owned a ranch and a mine outside Nevada City, California. He traded some of his mining shares for the Empire Bakery in Nevada City about a year after that. By 1856, the residents, so impressed by the young man, persuaded him to run for sheriff. At the age of 24, he became marshal to the third largest settlement in California. The young marshal was well liked by the Nevada citizens, sorry, the Nevada City, Nevada City citizens, because we're still in California and respected for his promptness and boldness in handling his duties. He easily won the re-election in 1857, but shortly after the election, he killed a man. There were two theories about how this came to be. The first said that Henry was having an affair with the minor of, sorry, oh my gosh, with the wife of a minor named John Vetter, and when the angry husband confronted him and challenged him to a duel, Henry won. The second theory was that he had been providing protection for Lucy Vetter, the miner's wife, who was seeking to escape from her abusive husband. Henry claimed he was acting in self-defense by participating in the duel and by killing the miner. Henry was arrested and tried. He went on trial. He was found guilty. His case was sent to the Supreme Court. He was granted a second trial. And that, again, was found guilty. And his case was again sent to the California Supreme Court, where, he was, where his conviction of second-degree murder was upheld. He was sentenced to 10 years in California's infamous San Quentin Prison. Henry began to serve his sentence on February 22nd, 1859, and the residents of the town still quickly petitioned the governor for a pardon, claiming that Henry had acted in self-defense. The governor granted the pardon due to Henry's good work, um, prison record, his attempt to convince a corrupt warden to improve conditions, and his work in assisting the prison doctor, as well as... Henry being ill with tuber tuberculosis. 
tuberculosis, or consumption as it was called, tended to spread among large populations of people when they were in confined, damp, wet, cold areas. Um, so the governor had a lot of reasons to pardon Henry for his crime. At first, Henry returned to being a policeman after his pardon. He later returned to Nevada City to the bakery and became an avid customer of the many brothels in the settlement. Before long, he was penniless and soon joined a group of bandits intent upon robbing area stagecoaches. One stage driver got away with his passengers and cargo intact, and Henry was arrested. Standing trial for attempted robbery, the former sheriff caught a reprieve when he was acquitted due to lack of evidence. But trouble had begun to follow Henry around, and soon he was caught up in a brawl over a painted lady, that's in quotes, like you can see me making air quotes, with a man named William Riley. So I did not, could not find the woman's name, and I am, I am guessing that the phrase painted lady meant a woman who maybe had less than a pristine reputation, maybe she wore lots of makeup, or worked in one of the previously mentioned brothels. However, Henry then shot William on October 27th, 1861, and was arrested again. This time he escaped prison by bribing a jailer before he could even be tried and headed for Oregon. Henry then headed into the Washington Territory where gold had been discovered. There, he became involved in, in another dispute that, in, that ended in a gunfight that he won. Along the way, he met another bandit named Jim Mayfield, and Jim was allegedly running because he had killed the sheriff of a neighboring town. So both Henry and Jane, sorry, Henry and Jim were wanted men, and Henry being the intelligent young man that he was, as well as a former sheriff, sent word to a California newspaper that he and Jim had both been hanged in Washington. The Desired outcome was that the posses and the lawmen would stop looking for them and they could stop looking over their shoulders. And it worked. People assumed that it was a true report and stopped looking for Henry and Jim. In January of 1862, Henry landed in Lewiston, Idaho with a companion, a woman companion, a different woman companion, <laughs> and registered at the Luna House where he began working in a casino. While working this casino, he ran into an old cellmate named Cyrus Skinner and a few other individuals, let's call them, such as Clubfoot George Lane and Bill Bunton. Forming a gang, the like-minded men begin to rob the local families of the area mining camps and primarily targeted the gold shipments traveling, through, traveling the roads from the mines. Somewhere along the line, Henry abandoned his mistress, a woman who had three children, who then had to resort to prostitution to feed herself and her family. That was prostitution, not whatever word came out of my mouth. Henry then began to roam the area between Elk City, Florence, and Lewiston. In Orofino, Idaho, he killed a saloon keeper named Patrick Ford. When the saloon keeper kicked Henry and some of his friends out of the saloon, George Ford, assumedly a relative, followed them to the stable where he fired upon them. Henry returned fire and killed George. And when some of George's friends began to form a lynch mob, Henry hightailed it out of there and headed east to Montana. See, we have finally landed in our destination. We have gotten to Montana. By September of 1862, Henry began to feel the effects of his tuberculosis and decided to leave the West and return to Maine, which I find odd because by that point in time in history, they had discovered that the dry, arid climate of the Southwest was better for tuberculosis. But I digress. Heading from Idaho across the Bitterroot Mountains, he traveled to Fort Benton, intending to go back east. Unfortunately, the Upper Missouri River at Fort Benton was frozen and closed to riverboat traffic. 
While he was waiting for a steamboat to reach Fort Benton, Henry was approached by a man named James Vail. James was recruiting volunteers to help protect his family at the mission station he was attempting to found in Sun River, Montana. Needing a plan and a place to hold over for the winter, Henry went to work as a ranch hand at the Sun River farm. Another man had also accepted a job at the ranch. His name, Jack Cleveland, a horse dealer who had known Henry in California. How had he known him? While serving as a policeman after his release from jail in 1859, Henry carried out an arrest of a man named John Ferguson who had escaped from San Quentin prison. Once John was released from prison, he changed his name to Jack Cleveland. While at the mission, both Henry and Jack fell in love with James's attractive sister-in-law, Electa Bryan. Henry asked her to marry him and she agreed. As gold had recently been discovered in nearby Bannock, Montana, Henry decided to go there to try and earn enough money to support them both. Jack followed. Henry rounded up another gang, calling themselves the Innocents, and began to relive, relieve, wowzers, words are hard, began to relieve the gold-laden travelers from the Montana camps of their valuables. The Innocents grew quickly and became so large that secret handshakes and code words were in, instituted so that one member of the Innocent gang could recognize another. In January of 1863, Jack, nursing his anger at Henry for, first of all, arresting him in California after his escape, and his jealousy over Electa choosing Henry, forced Henry into a fight and was shot. The altercation took place in a crowded saloon, and observers agree that Henry had killed his foe in self-defense. Jack was suspected of killing a man and stealing, stealing his gold the week before. Henry himself caught Jack trying to steal his own gold, but Jack was unaware that Henry only left out gold dust. He had buried his gold in his dirt floor shack and then poured water on top of the floor to hide any signs of soft or recently dug up dirt. The not-yet-dead Jack was taken to the home of a butcher named Hank Crawford, two doors down from the saloon. Hank listened to Jack talk and his la as, as he was dying, and he listened to him tell the tale of Henry's deceit and corruption. Three hours later, Jack was dead, and Henry was arrested. However, Henry received yet another reprieve when he was acquitted based on witness testimony that Jack had threatened him. Many miners and prospectors had been bullied by Jack and or had their gold stolen from them by him. Henry was viewed very favorably by most of the town residents. He kind of um, eliminated a problem there, more than caused a problem apparently. <laughs> By late spring of 1863, more than 10,000 men were hunting for gold along Grasshopper Creek, and the lawlessness in Bannock, Montana, had reached epidemic proportions. The frightened citizens of the settlement decided that the outlaws had to be stopped, and they advertised for a sheriff. Two men, vowing to corral the outlaws, stepped up to the plate, Henry Plummer and the butcher, Hank Crawford. The butcher who just listened to Jack tell him what a horrible person Henry was. Yeah, that Hank. Henry lost the election to the popular butcher, an event that kind of fired up his reckless temper, and he went after the new sheriff with a shotgun. However, a friend had warned Hank that Henry was coming, and Hank shot Henry in his right arm, temporarily ruining his gunfight abilities. Undaunted, Henry immediately practiced shooting with his left hand until his accuracy was just as deadly. When Hank Crawford caught wind of this, he turned in his badge, left Bannock, and never returned. 
Wisconsin. In the new election for sheriff, Henry became the leading lawman on May 24, 1863. He quickly appointed two of his henchmen, Buck Stinson and Ned Ray, as deputies. Unknown to the people of Bannock, Henry's group of innocents had now reached over 100 people. Having the opposite desired effect for the citizens of Bannock, crime in the town increased dramatically after Henry was elected sheriff. In the next few months, more than 100 citizens were murdered. And there is, in my sources linked below, a list of some of the crimes that occurred in this time frame. On June 20th, 1863, Henry and Electa were married and soon settled into their log home in Bannock. However, Electa did not stay long. Less than three months later, she left for her parents' home in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, Iowa, and she would never see Henry again. The innocents stepped up their efforts to rob the gold-laden travelers from the Montana camps and help the sheriff punish the, quote, villains of the community on gallows that Henry had had erected. However, the few hanged on it by Henry and his men were not actually members of the innocents group or gang. The innocents were well organized and said to have killed anyone who might witness their crimes, most of which were quickly covered up. Latent killings went unpunished. Residents who suspected anything feared for their lives and kept their mouths closed. The ambitious sheriff soon extended his operations to Virginia City when he was appointed Deputy U.S. Marshal for the region of Idaho Territory east of the mountains in August of 1863. By December of 1863, the citizens of Bannock and Virginia City had had enough. Remember that Montana's not quite a state yet. That's why I keep saying territory. Men from Bannock, Virginia City, and nearby Nevada City met secretly and organized the Montana Vigilantes. Masked men then began visiting suspected outlaws in the middle of the night, issuing warnings and tacking up posters featuring skull and crossbones, or the mystic numbers 3777. While the meaning of those numbers remains elusive, the Montana State Highway Patrolmen wear the emblem 3777 on their shoulder patches still today. The vigilantes dispensed rough justice by hanging about 24 men. When one such man, Erastus, a.k.a. Red Jaeger, was about to be hanged, he pointed the finger at Henry Plummer as the gang leader and all the stuff hit the fan. Everything broke loose. The residents were divided, some thinking that Henry could not possibly be and others agreeing that Henry probably was part of or the leader of this murderous gang. One night after heavy drinking in a local saloon, the vigilantes decided that Henry was guilty and tracked him down. On January 10th of 1864, somewhere between 50 and 75 men gathered up Henry and his two main deputies, Buck and Ned. The three were marched to those very same gallows that Henry had built. Ned was the first hanged, followed by Buck, both men swearing every step of the way. According to one legend, Henry promised to tell the vigilantes where $100,000 of gold was buried if they would let him live. However, vigilantes ignored this as they gradually hoisted him up by the neck. After the execution, armed guards stood by the gallows for about an hour. The three bodies were left hanging until the following day. Henry's was the only body placed in a wooden coffin and none were buried in the cemetery. But instead, all three were buried in shallow graves in Hangman's Gulch about a hundred yards up from the gallows. The vigilantes went on to hang the rest of the road agents that they could locate in such locations as Hellgate, which became Missoula, Cottonwood, which is now Deer Lodge, Fort Owen, and Virginia City. Vulnerable to vandalism, legend has it that the grave of Henry was broken into on two occasions. The first time, allegedly by the doctor who, out of curiosity, severed the right arm from the body to search for the bullet that had hit Henry 
when he went after Hank, the butcher. Reportedly, the doctor found that the bullet, quote, worn smooth and polished by the bones turning upon it. The second time his grave was broken into, it was reportedly by two men around the turn of the century who decided to dig up the grave after spending several hours in a local bar. To prove they had done it, they severed the head and carried it back to the Bank Exchange Saloon, where it remained on the back bar for several years until the building burned along with all of its contents. Yet another legend states that the skull found its way into the hands of an unnamed doctor who sent the specimen back east to a scientific institution to try to figure out why Henry was so evil. Electa learned of her husband's death in a letter. She always maintained that he was innocent. In fact, in the past several decades, many historians, researchers, and authors have also questioned whether the tell of her the tale of Henry Plummer was rightfully told. Many believe the whole thing is all a fraud, a fabricated story to cover up the real lawlessness in the Montana Territory, the vigilantes themselves. Many of the early stories on which the outlaw tale is based were written by the editor of the Virginia City newspaper, who was a member of the vigilantes. Further testimony to support the theory is that the robberies did not cease after 21 men were hanged in January and February of 1864. In fact, after the Plummer gang hangings, the stage robbery showed more evidence, organized criminal activity, more robbers involved in holdups, and more intelligence passed along to the actual robbers. Having taken control, the vigilantes were ruthless. On one such occasion, in an attempt to get the name of the road agents, they looped a noose around the neck of a suspected Long John Frank and repeatedly hoisted him until the poor man gasped out the answers the vigilantes wanted to hear. This was the same method they had used on Erastus, a.k.a. Red Jaeger, who was the one who had pointed the finger at Henry as being the leader of the gang. Further, the vigilantes allowed no criticism of their methods. When a preacher's son named Bill Hunter expressed his outrage by shouting in a mining camp street that pro-vigilantes were stranglers, his frozen corpse was found three weeks later dangling from the limb of a cottonwood tree. There is little evidence connecting Henry with any crime committed in the Bannock area other than the, quote, confession of a criminal attempting to save his own life. Um, Erastus. Henry's activities as an outlaw band leader in Lewiston have also been disputed when evidence was found that he was not in Lewiston at that time, but was still living in California. Three years after Henry was killed, the vigilantes virtually ruled the mining districts. Finally, leading citizens of Montana, including the territorial governor, Thomas Meager, began to speak out against the ruthless group. In March 1867, the miners issued their own warning that if the vigilantes hanged any more people, the law-abiding citizens would retaliate five for one. Though a few more lynchings occurred, it was clear that the area of the vigilantes had passed. On May 7, 1899, a posthumous trial was held in the Virginia, Virginia City, Montana courthouse. The 12 registered voters on the jury were split 6-6 six to six on the verdict, which led Judge Barbara Book to declare a mistrial. Had Henry been alive, he would have been freed and not tried again. This is more than a hundred years after his hanging. As to what happened to Electa, she ultimately moved to Vermilion, South Dakota, where she married James Maxwell, a widower with two daughters. Electa and James had two sons of their own, Vernon and Clarence. And Electa lived until May 5th, 1912, where she was buried in Wakanda, South Dakota. 
The historical town of Bannock, Montana, was placed under the protection of Montana's Department of Fish, Wildlife, and Parks in 1954 and is now called the Bannock State Park. Okay, so I chose this story not because it's our first story of a sheriff turned outlaw or even our first falsely accused story, but of because how young this man was and how much crime he was accused of with very little evidence. The only actual witnesses against Henry were a man who had a grudge against him for arresting him and marrying the girl that he wanted. And a man who was tortured to death to give up Henry's name. Hank the Butcher heard terrible stories from a man who had reason to hate Henry. And it is likely that he told those stories to other people. And the man who published the stories was himself a member of a group of men accused of committing the actual crimes that Henry was tried of. And when evidence appeared that Henry wasn't even in the state when he was accused of some crimes, that does make you believe that maybe something else was going on. So while this Henry was not born and raised in Montana, he did spend a lot of his life there. And I found pictures. This is Henry. He's a dashing looking young man. Keep in mind that he was just barely 30 or just younger when he was hanged. And I did find a picture of his wife, Electa, later in her life. She looks like a very prim and proper woman herself. I wish the picture was a little bit better. And I found a picture of the tombstone that is um, on Henry's grave. So I hope you enjoyed the intrigue in this story. I'm always up for a little bit of intrigue. And thank you so much for stopping by my channel today. I have added a couple of other videos here that I think you might like, as well as a subscribe button. If you have not yet subscribed to my channel, I would love it if you did. Leave me a comment down below, give me a thumbs up, and have a really awesome crime-free kind of day.